I appreciate the song selection tonight. As we <laughs> sang the song, Angry Words, and as we think about the love that, that, that's, uh, that expresses we ought to have and share with our brethren and one another, it uh, fits right along with what we've been studying this morning as we continue tonight with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and the study of, of the, the way that love is manifested, the way it's expressed. And uh, as we pick up where we left off this morning, we had discussed this morning, of course, that the, the idea that the world has of love, it's, it's very selfish, very self-centered in that, you know, looking for love, and it's really usually romantic love, and as people discuss uh, in, the, in, the, in the poetic sense, the, the, the popular songs, that love is expressed in a way that what satisfies me, what gives me the pleasure, and wow, how I am, uh, um, find love for my uh, enjoyment. And whereas the love we learn about in the Bible, the agape love, the perfect love, the love that God extends to us, and love that we're commanded by Christ to have one for another, that agape love is a love that's, that's committed to the benefit and welfare of the other's interests. Um, and as we see, go through this, as we looked at uh, beginning in verse 4 this morning, charity or love suffereth long and is kind, and ch- it envieth not, it vaunteth not itself, it doesn't boast itself, it's not puffed up, it doesn't think too much of itself. Um, they had had a problem with, with uh, in Corinth that uh, they um, were thinking very highly of themselves, were having gifts of tongues. In fact, that may have been the very, it was so demonstrative. It's the most. Ex- uh, uh, exhibits so much more than any of the other gifts. It's so, uh, and so they, they took pride in the fact that, that they could speak in tongues. Um, um, and, and of course, the, I, that with this, they were getting puffed up. They're getting uh, arrogant about things. And Paul was warning them, this is not about you <laughs> individually, okay? It's about the body of Christ. And he, he discusses how the body of Christ has many, having many members, each member working toward the benefit of the whole, just like the human body having its various members. And that uh, every aspect of our human body, or the physical aspect, works toward the benefit of the whole. Of the whole. When, you, you, when you pound your thumb with a hammer, what's the first thing you do? The whole body focuses upon that pain of that, that thumb. You know, it, it immediately comes up. You know, st- you've heard the term sticking out like a sore thumb. That's what he means. You know, your sore thumb is, wow, get it, get it. And you try to comfort it, okay? And when you lose a seemingly insignificant uh, aspect of your body, like you, if you've, you've stubbed your toe, your, your small itty-bitty toe, and, and you stubbed it, and it hurts to walk upon that, so as you, you uh, limp along, you realize how important that little toe is in the, the benefit and the use, utility of the, for the entire body. Without the use of it, you realize how important that little tiny member is. And in the same way with the Lord's body. So with that, Paul, and there's a discussion about love and how it's manifested and how it is the most, it is most important, a motive for doing all wonderful, great things uh, for the kingdom. Um, as he opens up in the opening verses of chapter 13, if he speaks with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become a sounding brass or tinkling, tinkling cymbal. Um, so we see the importance of love, because without that motivation, it's just, uh, it's all vain. It becomes just big noise. So as we pick up with uh, the, the, that love is, does not behave itself unseemly, love does not behave itself uh, unseemly, as in verse 5, what does it mean to behave oneself unseemly? Well, in a way that is, that is rather... Uh, uh, distasteful. Um, you know, those who are rude, those who are tactless, those who are disrespectful, they're not displaying love at all. Think about unseemly. Those are those behaviors that, that are ugly. It's behaviors that are ugly at, that as, as one is, is tactless in his approach to things and in and, and, uh, his communications. You know, we, we, the James talks about our, uh, taming the tongue. You know, the, t- the tongue is a small member, just like our, our small toe is. Our tongue is a small member, as James writes, that, but yet it yields so much power, just like the rudder of a, of a great ship. As a small part of that ship, but yet that rudder guides the entire vessel, whatever which way. Um, in the same way, the bridle, um, 
of a horse. You put that bit in the, in the ho horse's mouth that as you turn, you turn the entire beast with just a small effort, small, uh, small pressure and force on that horse's mouth, that small member has such control. And so it is with our tongue. And so as we consider behaving ourselves unseemly includes control of our tongue, that we, that we aren't rude, we aren't tactless, and we aren't disrespectful. You know, we think about respect your elders. That's very important. Uh, as, and that's not just for children. It's not just for teenagers. It's all of us as we respect all of our elders. You know. we, uh, Timothy was instructed to treat the elder, elder men like uh, respectfully. Okay. Um, and, and so we must understand that as we do not behave ourselves unseemly, our exhibiting our love toward others, and of course, we also regard those that are younger than us too. We don't just respect our elders, but also we, we understand uh, how, the, uh, how angry words can hurt someone. We understand that, and so we control our tongue not to hurt, not to discourage the young ones, but rather to encourage them and build them up. And, you know, kind words go a long way. Kind words go a long way to edifying individuals. Um, uh, uh, to encourage them to, to achieve more, and it, and it really, it's, it's, it's like a, 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 a charge of, of energy. When, when somebody notices you're trying and they give you kind words or encouragement, what does it do for you? It lifts you up, it makes you want to try doubly hard to achieve your goals. Okay. So, as we consider the, does not behave itself unseemly, love is courteous. Love is careful to observe forms of respect. You know, uh, I've, heard it's, uh, I've heard it said that about those visitors from the south who go to the north, and, and the, because of their customary ways of interacting, verb, their verbal usage, uh, it's, it's, it's regards like well, how, how quaint. But, you know, concepts like, like phrases like, thank you, you're welcome, please, may I? No, sir. No, ma'am. You know, excuse me. Our, these are all expressions which show a healthy respect for others and the dignity of their being. You know, and it, uh, it usually is you consider the southern way of life usually uses those kinds of phrases in a way that is respectful of others. And, it's not, and it shouldn't be just those of the south. Of course not. Okay. As we consider the, the use of our interaction, our, our, uh, what they would call verbal intercourse, that uh, it, these just niceties, these forms of respect are... are they are welcome to hear and warm to hear, and there are ways of behaving in a way that are not rude, not tactless. They are not unseemly, but rather they are courteous. Love does not seek her own. And that's probably the most, the largest aspect of this love is, love does not seek its own um, or her own. It's, it's not selfish. It's not conceited. It's only interested in what benefits uh, um, the others about him. Okay, look at First Corinthians chapter ten. First Corinthians chapter ten, verse twenty-four. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth or another's well-being. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, then eat. He's discussing the eating of meats, but let's as he's discussing the eating of meats in, in chapter ten. That, uh, that they, sh they should be concerned about the, the weaker brethren. Um, they should be concerned about uh, causing another to stumble. And the eating of meats in the, in, that were sold in the common market, that they should, uh, um, that's fine to eat them. But, but as we consider what we should do, let's not seek our own interest and what my rights are. And that's, that's a big statement here. I have my rights. I have the right to do this. I have the right to do that. Whereas the love that, that uh, expressed in the Bible, we may very well have the rights, okay? We may very well have the freedom and liberty, and we do have liberty in Christ. We have the liberty to, to eat the meats that were sacrificed to idols. But is that the best thing to do? Is that the, the, the right thing to do in consideration of others that we may influence and affect? So we consider also, as we, the love that we might have, how do we influence and affect others? And as we look at our, our, our lives, we're not solely interested in ourselves, but rather, we're, and we don't seek our own, but rather we seek the welfare and benefit of our brethren and those about us. 
Love is not easily provoked. Think about one who's not easily provoked is not easily roused to anger nor to irritation. My mom, mother used to always tell me, you provoke me. Of course, what she meant is you're making me angry. You know? and, and that was a nice way of saying it, I suppose. But I, I was causing her to get aggravated with me and uh, raising her ire. You know? and, uh, and, and as we think about love um, is not easily provoked, doesn't mean it's not provoked, it just means it's not easily provoked. As we love others, whether it be our children, that we watch out how we're provoked, or others, you know, that, that it's not easily provoked to anger, to wrath. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the, the saying, well, that's just the way I am. You know, when, when I respond like this, I'm hot-headed. I'm hot-headed, and that's just the way I am. That's no excuse. We have to understand that all of us have our shortcomings. All of us have our, our issues that we need to deal with so that we exhibit the love of Christ uh, uh, more positively, more effectively, so that when they say that that's just the way I am, that's a cop-out. That's a cop-out saying, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to control this in my life because I'm going to be what I want to be. Okay. So we have to understand, I'm just that way is no excuse, and rather, rather it should be, that's what I'm dealing with, I have to overcome this. Okay. And it's, that's my challenge I'm going to deal with. That's my challenge I'm going to attack, and I'm going to control it. You know, um, and when we look at those challenges in our own lives, when we talk about we read the Bible and we add those things to our lives, we pray that often. What do we mean by that? Let us add these things to our lives. And we ought, we ought to read the Bible, see what the mirror to our soul reveals to us, and make those adjustments, be willing to make those adjustments. And so uh, as we add them to our lives, that means we adjust our behavior. We take control. We take control. You know, Paul said he buffeted his body daily so that, that, that he, his body would remain under his control. And so it is our bodies and our behavior and our tongue should be in our control. And we attack it every day, bit by bit. Some things take longer. Other things can be dealt with more rapidly. For instance, when we obey the gospel, we repent of our sins, there are things we stop immediately. We know that we just don't. But there are other things, aspects that take hold of, 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 uh, of uh, take hold of us before we, we realize what's going on in our reaction. Um, and so we identify those things and we deal with those things. We pray about those things. And, and uh, one thing I, I like to, uh, as I consider this, help me to identify those things in my life that I need to learn to control. Help me identify when it's beginning to happen so I can change the course where it's going. And so uh, as we consider um, that uh, love is not easily provoked, I'm taking my tongue under control. I'm taking my anger or irritations out of, under my control. And I work with it. And it doesn't necessarily mean it always goes away. You know, the Bible talks about the tongue can, can be tamed, but it can't be, uh, it can't be uh, uh, controlled. Okay, we can, we can uh, uh, tame it, rather, uh, but, but we, it can't be tamed, rather, but we can control it. Okay. Um, if we want to learn to love, we will cease to excuse ourselves and work on our self-control. That's, if we really want it, we're going to stop. You know, that's part of, that's, think about uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. That is an organization that tries to help men and women who are, are alcoholics, deal with it, come to terms with it, so they do put it, take it under control. And one of the first things they do is they must admit they have a problem. Unless one admits he's got a problem, he'll never deal with it. And so that's when, when we have to deal with being easily provoked, we have to admit, yes, I'm easily provoked. And so that's the beginning of our journey to control uh, our temper, our tongue, or whatever it might be, so that we are not easily provoked. Proverbs 16.32 tells us that he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. That's power, that's strength. When you can, can rule yourself, you are mightier than the greatest general. You are stronger um, than uh, those who uh, command great armies and that take great cities through sieges. Okay. Ephesians 4.26 teaches us to be ye angry and sin not. 
Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Um, so, uh, so, yes, anger. You know, God gets angry. Anger's not a sin. It's what you do with that anger. In the case of God, when he became angry, he, he, he did righteously. He judges righteously, and he made righteous uh, um, um, conclusions, and the, the, what he did was righteous. Um, it's interesting to note that God, that, that God was angry with the children of Israel after having delivered them out of the bondage of Egypt, and yet they still return to many of the idolatrous practices that they did, well, at least the Egyptians did, while they were in Egypt, probably while they themselves were there too. Um, and so as God became angry, he told Moses that he was ready to destroy them all. He was ready to destroy them all and start again with Moses. That through Moses he would fulfill the promise, and that would still be fulfilling his promise to Abraham, Moses being a descendant of Abraham, but Moses appealed to God and said, what are, what are the, what's, what are the, what's the world going to say? That you t- delivered them out of the hand, bondage of Egypt, and you brought them out to the wilderness, and you destroyed them. What are, the, what are they going to say? You're a righteous God. And so God uh, understood what Moses was saying, of course, and he, he did not destroy the, the nation of Israel uh, at that point. Uh, but God was angry, and so God's anger is a righteous anger, but as we consider our own anger, it's what we do with it. There are constructive ways we can deal with our anger, that we, uh, uh, we can uh, get things done that need to be done, or we can be destructive, and we can tear people apart, lash out with them, you know. Uh, once again, go back, going back to the use of our tongue, we can lash out at people and cut them to pieces with, with a very sharp tongue, or... We can do those things that edify with our anger. Think about that. Anger can motivate us to edify others. Anger can motivate us to uh, do good things, okay, with a zeal that, that, uh, 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 with a fire, with an energy that uh, will get things done. Will get things done. Um, So as we consider that that, uh, love does... uh, is not easily provoked, and so we need to learn uh, ways to, to uh, channel our anger, channel our responses, that, or if we're provoked, in constructive ways, and that makes sure that we are not easily provoked. Okay? Love thinks no evil. Love thinks no evil regarding others, basically. Love does not keep a list of things done, by us, done to us by others. You know, we think about, as, as the Bible teaches us to be forgiving, have a, have a forgiving spirit. And it teaches us when one comes to us that, and they're, they're having sinned against us, that they, as they, ex, as they uh, try to make things right with us, they express uh, their sorrow, their, their, their repentance, and they, they seek our forgiveness. What does the Bible say that we are to do? Jesus said up to how many times? Not merely seven times in a single day. If your brother sins against you seven times, now think about that. Somebody does you wrong seven times in the same day? That's a lot. So as Peter came to Jesus asking, you know, how many times should I forgive my brother? How many times? Seven times? Well, that's a lot, you know. But Jesus said, no, not seven, not merely seven, but seven times 70, up to 490 times. Of course, we understand he's using hyperbole. He's using figure. They're not, not so much as you have to forgive him up to 490 times. And that's not what he's meant. He meant as many times as, as your brother comes to you, repenting of sins, that he, the things he's done against you, you need to re- forgive him of those sins. And so, as we, we, we don't keep a list, you know, we can forgive others, but then, I'm not going to forget. You know, he said, I might forgive you, but I'm not for, forget. We've heard of forgive and forget. But so, I'm not going to forget. Well, that's, what, that's not love. Love does not keep a list of things that others have done to us. We do not look for evil in another, per, another person's life. We don't look for the bad things. Love plans, devises no evil. Uh, As you consider, love thinking no evil of others, but also thinking no evil on to dwell upon, on on things to do. It devises no evil. The Christian desires to think well of a person and looks for the noble rather than the ignoble, the beautiful rather than the ugly, and the good rather than the bad in others. 
It's like a vision of what you can be. It's like when you look at your children, what do you think? Yes, he's a person like anybody else. He's a little boy or a little girl just like any, of, any other little boy or little girl. And he's got things he's got to learn. And, and, but I have a vision for that, for that young man or young woman, that boy or girl, that they're going to grow up to be mature, uh, uh, healthy, and uh, kind and thoughtful to other people. And so with that vision, we strive to work for that. And so the love that, that a parent has for his child is not condemning, but rather teaching and disciplining. Um, the the uh, Christian love that love the Christian ought to have or anybody ought to have is it abhors attributing an evil motive to ugly conduct. You know, sometimes when people uh, uh, will behave badly, and we think, well, he's got to be having this in mind. Well, we don't know that. We don't have perfect uh, knowledge, and so just as we're taught to have righteous judgment, as we look at others who may behave badly, love does not attribute an evil motive for that. He must be doing something. He's doing this because of this. Well, how do we know that? Well, we're, we're just conjecturing in that matter. So that love does not uh, attribute evil motive to other people's bad behavior. It might be, but we give them the benefit of the doubt. We give them the benefit of the doubt. Basically, if we love, we give people the benefit of the doubt. You've heard that term before. The benefit uh, it says, well, there's a doubt. There, I have a doubt that that's why they did it. So I'm going to give them the benefit of that doubt, that I'm not going to condemn them because, because of this. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Of course not. As we consider our Father who is righteous and has forgiven us of our unrighteousness, and so as he has been so gracious and merciful to us, and we are commanded to love one another, so therefore we do not rejoice in unrighteousness. When we see... Uh, When we see evil going on, we don't rejoice in it. And we see, when we see people, other people suffer because of their unrighteousness, we don't rejoice in that either. Um, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. 2 Thessalonians 2, 11. says, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. Talking about those, uh, um, those whose coming is after the working of Satan, those who are wick wicked and revealed. To, um, they're basically the false teachers. And as we, he sees it, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. They had pleasure in evil. Uh, Romans chapter 1 talks about those who denying God, having a knowledge of God, but yet they denied that knowledge. They denied his existence. And uh, thinking himself become, themselves being wise, they became foolish. And they delight, they not only uh, delighted in evil behavior, sinful behavior, debauchery, but they delighted in other people. If, if those, there was not enough that they themselves were involved, but also they, they delighted in other people. And so here there are those that will be damned, condemned, because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. And love is nothing like that. Love does not delight, does not uh, in delight in unrighteousness. Look at 2 Timothy 2.19. 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal... The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We're not to, to rejoice in unrighteousness. We are to depart in iniquity. Um, and so, so love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rather love rejoices in the truth. That's what we rejoice in. We rejoice in the truth. Um, you know, Christ bring it, brought, brings us the truth, and that truth would set us free. And, and those that hear his voice, believe the truth, shall also be free. As he told Pilate that, uh, he, came, uh, that he brought the truth, and that those that believe and believe the truth, that Pilate asked the question, what is truth? And that's, that's a question that goes around all the time, you know, with, especially today when there are so many, what they call, uh, um, uh, they, they deny the fact that you can actually know anything for, with certainty. You know, 
and, and they reject the idea that you can know something with certainty. Uh, rather, it's, it's and, and so con moral concepts of right and wrong are rather nebulous and, and can't be proven and is rather uh, dependent upon the situation. We call that situation ethics, ethics based upon what the situation is. Sometimes this acti activity is wrong, other times it's right, depending on what it is. And the, the problem with that is there's no absolute standard, no, no absolute, uh, uh, no absolute. And so uh, the fact that we can know the truth and that truth will make us free. Jesus said we can know the truth. And, and there's no doubt upon that. Doubt upon that. Look at Second John chapter chapter uh, verse one. Second John verse one. We're discussing how love rejoices in the truth. Uh, John writing to as he writes here, the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Interesting that love will last forever, and it will be in us forever. Grace be with you. Mercy and peace from God the Father and Lord, uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have rejoiced, uh, received the commandment from the Father. Um, so as they, he was rejoicing in learning that her children were walking in the truth, as we consider it, love rejoices in truth. And so as love, uh, John, of course, we look at him as the, the apostle of love because his, he, his first epistle deals with the commandment to love, love the brethren, and the proof of our love and love of God. And, and so as he, he his, his discussion about love in 1 John, in 2 John, he, he he says, he rejoices to, um, greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. So he rejoiced in the truth. As, so he basically exhibiting this manifestation of love, to rejoice in the truth. Love bears all things. Love bears all things. It's, you know, it's, love is patient. Love is kind. Love endures maltreatment. Love bears all things. You know, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 teaches us that we should bear one another's burdens. You know, there are burdens that we cannot bear alone, and these are the burdens that he's discussing. And in Galatians chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 2, he says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Fulfilling the law of Christ is what? To love one another. Bear ye one another's burdens. So as we help our brethren with burdens they, can't not, they cannot bear alone, to encourage them, to carry them along as we need to, to, so that they will not lose their faith. Remember, one of the aspects of, of the mission of the church is to keep those saved, that are saved, those who have obeyed the gospel. The Christian walk is not necessarily that easy. Sometimes things come down on, on an individual Christian, wears them down, beats him down, he loses his strength, he loses his resolve, and he needs encouragement. That's why we gather every first day of the week and that's why we gather on the midweek Bible class, not just to study the scriptures, but we receive encouragement in our singing, in the preaching, hopefully I'm encouraging the, in, in the, the lessons I teach, that we keep on going on, keeping the faith and lose not uh, our resolve to serve Christ, and to walk in the light, because the reward is great. It is so great that all the suffering we might endure here on earth all the, all the hassles we go through and all the, the, the uh, uh, persecutions and uh, uh, mistreatment that others, because they don't understand or they think we're ridiculous because you know, we believe in the, in the coming Christ, it's all going to be worth it, far more worth it than the effort we're putting in. Yes, we should put forth our 100% effort that we can. Unusual statement there. We should put all the effort, all of our effort for to walk in the light because the reward is far greater than we can imagine. So the love bears all things. As we bear others, and we, uh, as those we love, we bear the, all the difficulties that go along with that. Love believes all things. Love believes all things. It doesn't, doesn't mean it's gullible. Love is not gullible. Rather, love believes uh, desires to believe the very best about others until proven otherwise. 
you know, the word, Jesus teaches us to judge righteous judgment. We should not judge harshly or rashly, but rather based upon the facts. And as love doesn't believe bad things about people until proven so. Much like the adage, innocent until proven guilty. That's very popular in our, in our, in our Western culture, that one who is charged with, with a crime, he's innocent, considered innocent until proven guilty. Many, unfortunately, that has been distorted and perverted to where if someone is accused, people automatically assume he must be guilty. They wouldn't charge him unless he were guilty. Just like when the Jews brought Jesus to Pilate, and Pilate asked, what has he done? He says, well, he must have done something because we wouldn't have brought him to you other, unless he were, had done something wrong. Well, that, that's ridiculous logic. It's not logic at all. Um, and so as, as one might be charged with, with uh, a crime, one might be um, accused of something, having done something wrong that he hadn't done wrong at all. And so uh, that's what love will not believe it until the evidence is there. It's making righteous judgments based upon the facts. Proverbs 10.12 reads, Hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth all sins. 1 Peter 4, 8, And above all things, have fervent charity or love among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Have fervent charity. Fervent love. What does it mean to be fervent? What does it mean to be fervent? When you're fervent in, in, in uh, getting something done, what does that mean? You're driven. You're going to get it done. And so when you think about having fervent love of the brethren... You're resolved. You're focused. You're going to get that done. As, 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 yes, love is a work. Love can be a work in the sense of when love, love does this or love, does, love is not, love is. Okay? And there are different ways that love is manifested. And love here um, uh, believes all things. Um, Um, so love will not condemn one based upon wrong information from talebearers. Love demands the facts and settles for nothing less. Uh, love doesn't gossip. Love, love will not endure gossip, will not abide gossip. Love won't listen to it. Okay, and, and, uh, love hopes all things. Love hopes all things. Because of love, we see what things can be. We have a vision for those whom we love. We have a hope that these things will be. Love hopes all things, has a vision for others, for our Christian brethren, that I can see, I can see Spencer achieving this. I can see Ethan. I can see every one of you young men, I can see them achieving these great things, these great goals, whether it be preaching, whether it be the song leading in such a way that everybody's so, so they, they come here just for the singing, you know. I can see that in you. That's hopes all things. And is it so? Maybe not, but it, 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 it looks at the possibilities and has this vision for that and uh, works for that, toward that end. We have a hope that thing, these things will be. That's what love is. Love endures all things. Paul's love for those in Corinth and other cities where, where he preached. Think about that. He loved Corinth so much. He wrote this, the first Corinthian letter and the second Corinthian letter. And he dealt with them and was so patient with them, teaching them night and day, teaching the, the church in Ephesus with tears, warning the, the eldership there about the coming uh, uh, false teaching that was going to come even out from among themselves, the elders of that congregation in, in, in Ephesus. And so Paul loved them so dearly. Christ loved us so dearly, he endured the cross. God loves us so dearly, he waits for us patiently to respond to his gospel. You know, we do, do we not better understand God's love for mankind and why he has been so patient with us to respond to his grace? Do we not understand that as we consider what love is? Now, God not only exemplifies this agape love, but is that agape love. God is love. Christ's love for all men caused him to taste death for every man. Hebrews 2.9 We should have the mind of Christ and the love that he had. In Philippians 2.4 Look not every man to his own things, but every man also on the things of others. 
Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no, no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is the love of Christ. Endures all things. Bears all things. You know, we must love the brethren fervently out of a pure heart. It should be genuine and not faked. Not plastic faces, but rather real. That's another thing. We can, we can, we can actually generate this genuine love and it doesn't have to be fake. We just have to do it. We also love those who are lost in sins. We must fulfill our master's will to seek and to save those that are lost. When we look at those who are lost in sin, what do we think about? Do we have a vision for them and a hope for them that they can find salvation? Or do we say they're just stuck in their ways and they're going to be lost forever and they, they, their way of thinking is so filthy, their behavior is so filthy, I cannot be a part of that. Well, no, the Christian does not... Uh, be a part of that lifestyle, but yet the love of the Christian for the lost, having a vision and a hope for those who would possibly obey the gospel and find everlasting life, we don't know. We don't know what effect we can have upon them, but we don't know until we do, until we try. We should take advantage of the opportunities that we have to love the brethren and to love the world, opportunities to reach the world where we can. This is the love of God. This is the love that uh, um, Christ commands us to have. This is the love that God expects us to have. This is the love that God exhibits to us, extends toward us and all mankind. So this is, of course, not, a, not an, exhaustive, an exhaustive discussion and, and uh, exposition on love of the Bible, but rather it's, it's uh, somewhat cursory. But yet it does discuss some things, causes us to think, and, and uh, be introspective as the Bible being a mirror reveals to us what manner of man am I? What manner of man am I? And of course, all of us stand before God within the same position, having sin. For all his sin, fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And what's the consequence of that? The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. But what? But, the gift of God, the free gift of God, as the American Standard puts it, is everlasting life, eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We can have everlasting life, enjoying, basking in the love of God in our obedience to the gospel. We must first have faith, 11, uh, Hebrews 11.6. We must believe uh, that God is, and we must believe in Christ and confess that Jesus is the Son of God, Matthew 10.32 and 33. And we must repent of our sins, Luke 13, 3, and Acts 2, 38, and be baptized for the remission of sins, also Acts 2, 38. If you need to respond to the gospel invitation to find everlasting life, to enjoy the grace, mercies, and love of God, forgiveness of sins, and come forward as we stand and as we sing.